Good evening, YouTube. Air of Carthage here, and we had some exciting news recently. The folks at Creative Assembly shared with us the recommended specifications for a PC to play Total War Three Kingdoms, their upcoming launch this May. So if you want to be able to play that game, they gave you the parts and told you how, and I have those parts right here, and I'm going to help you put together the recommended gaming PC for Total War Three Kingdoms, and this is, of course, courtesy of my sponsor, MSI, and thank you to them for all the support, and because of them, I get to show you all how to do this. I have all the parts here. Let's just start real quick. In the recommended specs, we were given an Intel and an AMD. I've chosen AMD because I'm also trying to make this build budget conscious. So we have an MSI B450 Tomahawk motherboard. This is going to be the platform, and it's going to be powered by this Ryzen 5 2600X processor. And then our graphics, the MSI Ventus RTX 2060. So what did Total War recommend for this computer? Well, I've got some of the parts here. I'm going to talk through it. This build is going to be a little bit of a mix of their recommended and their 60 FPS specification. And quite honestly, I'm pretty sure this build is going to run it at 60 FPS. So they recommended a, from the AMD side an AMD R5 2600X and I am pairing that in this MSI B450 Tomahawk motherboard. So this big board I have in my hand is the motherboard and the small square you all see right down here, that's the Ryzen 5 processor. So the motherboard is basically the platform that all of your different hardware is going to connect to and that's why it's an important piece of building a computer. It is the base piece, if you will. So this is the motherboard. Why have I chosen this one? because it's got a lot of good features. They're gonna help you build a budget gaming computer. It's also gonna look good, but it's also gonna give you a lot of nice features that you only get on high-end gaming computers. So this, this board is a great way to split the difference between that too expensive world and the world that doesn't give you enough. So I will talk a little bit more about some of the specific features of this motherboard, but the main reason we've chosen it, it has four RAM slots, so we can fit plenty of memory to upgrade in the future if we want to. It has M.2 slots. Some people are gonna be like, Air, I don't know what you're speaking, some kind of foreign language. That's just a slot that we can hook up an ultra fast solid state drive to so that your loading screens are much shorter. So solid state drives are good. It also has different ports for other storage like hard drives and different solid state drives. So that's why we've chosen this board. Um, it looks good, it keeps things cool inside, and it powers up your Ryzen processor very well, even lets us overclock it if we want to. One of the reasons that I picked AMD over Intel here, because Intel does have a slight advantage at, um, uh, at 1080p gaming. I'll explain a little bit more what that means later. That's the resolution. So at 1080p resolution, um, Intel does have an advantage. But I picked AMD for two reasons. One, it's cheaper. Two, it's just as good in multi-core, for the most part, sometimes better than a, than a um, similar Intel part. But third, and most importantly, AMD is easier to cool, and it comes with its own cooler. Every processor has to have a cooler. When you get a high-end Intel processor, it doesn't even come with a stock cooler most of the time, and it costs you extra money, and they're harder to keep cool. So this is why I've gone with AMD. It comes with this cooler built in. You can see it here, it's a great cooler, works just fine, and I'm gonna show you all that you don't need a fancy cooler to run an awesome gaming PC. All right, the next part I wanna talk about is this MSI Ventus RTX 2060. So I picked this part here. Um, there is now a, 16, a GTX 1660 Ti of a similar look and spec out from, um, from MSI. Um, it's a great card, the 1660 Ti, but I picked the RTX 2060 because it gives us just a little more and um, it, it's going to also cost a little more. So you could do this similar build by downgrading to the 1660 Ti, um, but in this case I went with this one. This is about $350 US and this graphics card will definitely allow us to run the game on the ultra settings. Now that said, why do you need a graphics card for those not familiar? This is what actually processes the graphics in your game. It is a what's called a discrete graphics card. Sometimes you get a processor with built-in graphics. Those are usually just for very light gaming. If you want to do some real 
high-end gaming, you need a discrete graphics card, and this RTX 2060 is on the affordable end of a high-power graphics card. Yes, there are ones that are better, there are ones that are worse, but this one lands us in a neighborhood, like I said, where it's not cheap, but you're going to get a heck of a lot of graphics card for the price at 350 now that MSI motherboard is compatible with DDR4 RAM. RAM is also sometimes called memory, or DRAM, I guess. I don't know. I'm probably getting all the specifics wrong. I call it RAM. This is DDR4 memory. The more of this you have, the more room your computer has to run applications that are open. Uh, it's kind of like high-speed way to get stuff running fast. Um, there is a point at which having enough is enough. This is one stick of eight gigabytes. This in and of itself would probably be enough to, uh, to run games decently, but it doesn't hurt to go ahead and just get a second stick. RAM is getting cheaper. This particular memory is some HyperX DDR4. This is 2400 speed RAM. Not the fastest that's out there, but you'll notice that this RAM is pretty narrow from top to bottom, low profile, and this is really good stuff from HyperX. It's gonna be reliable, it's gonna get the job done, and it's not gonna get in the way of any of our other components because it doesn't have a huge, weird shape to it. This black color will look good in any build. So we're gonna have plenty of memory for running our game. All right, the last couple of components I'm gonna to show to you are storage. Now storage, think of it like a filing cabinet where all your games go. So the more storage you have, the more things you can put on your computer, um, but not all storage is created equal. This right here is a magnetic spinning hard drive. This one happens to be from Seagate. Um, this has one terabyte of capacity, which is a lot. You can put a lot of games, a lot of pictures, a lot of video. However, this is going to be a large capacity, but its speed is relatively outdated. So this is going into the build to just give us extra storage, while I'm going to put this storage into the build. This is a Kingston HyperX SSD. This is a 2.5 inch because of the measurement of it and um, it connects via a SATA cable, so you'll hear it called a SATA SSD, so S-A-T-A. -A. Um, don't worry about what it stands for, it's not important. Um, this is 256 gigabytes, so this right here is only one quarter of the capacity of the spinning hard drive below it, but this one is much, much faster. Have you ever played a Total War game and your loading screens were about two or three minutes long? Well, get one of these and that won't be the case, and that's why we're gonna spend a little bit of extra cash and put this in our build and make it have really fast loading screens for a good Total War experience. All right, so the last parts I'm gonna cover were actually um, sent as part of a build from Cooler Master as well. They've got a lot of great parts and I appreciate them having sent this with another MSI project previously because it comes in handy here. This is a Cooler Master MWE 550 watt gold rated fully modular power supply. That's a lot of words, so let's get in and explain it. <laughs> 550 watts is how much power you can deliver. 550 watts is um, plenty of power for a single graphics card and a normal gaming processor. So this is all of the power you would need to run any graphics card out there, even all the way up to the RTX 2080 Ti and all the, all the gaming processors that are out there. So it can handle any upgrade that you would throw at it unless graphics cards get much more power uh, hungry. Um, and fully modular means that there's no cables pre-attached to it. You only put the cables on it that you need. This makes it a lot easier to have a clean build. So definitely recommend it. And when I earlier said 80 plus gold, that is a rating that comes with it and means, and without getting into too much detail, you've got a bronze, silver, gold, and platinum rating. Um, a gold power supply means you're gonna have a really reliable power supply that's gonna deliver even power and you're not gonna have to worry about anything getting burned out from a bad power supply. So this is a great power supply. Now the case is a Cooler Master, and I'm gonna have to look at the name to get it right, TD500L. This is a mid-tower case in a budget range that gives us a lot of room to build in. You can actually see an old water cooler hanging in it right now, so you could even upgrade to water cooling. We're not gonna use water cooling in this build, um, but it's got three fans that come in it up front and one in the back, this case is about $60 to $70 US, depending on where you find it on sale. It's got a ton of room. It's a very clean build. And with all the built-in fans, you don't need to purchase anything else to go inside of it. So this, this TD500L case, definitely a great budget case. And it even has 
a um, synthetic window on the side, a plastic window that's tinted, makes your build look really nice whenever you turn it on. All right, so we've covered the parts. Just to recap, you need a processor, you need a motherboard, you need a graphics card, you need a power supply, you need RAM, you need storage, and you need a case. Those are the basic parts and, and cooling for your processor. In this case, it came with the processor we purchased. Always look before you buy it. Those are the parts you need. Now I'm gonna go through a step-by-step -step how to put them together. All right, so the first thing we need to do is put our processor into the socket on the motherboard. Now, an AM4 socket, which is what you see here, all that really means is that's the socket for a Ryzen processor, is very easy to use. You can see that there's small holes all over the socket. Those holes are where the pins on the back of the processor are going to fit. These pins are very delicate. Don't touch them and don't bend them or else this may not work. So in order to be safe, make sure you're grounded. I'm standing on a rubber mat right now and I've touched a metal surface to help ground myself and I don't have any socks on or anything else like that. Um, I'm ready to now install the processor. You can see I'm just holding it by the sides, not by the pins. There's a small metal lever here. You push it out to the side. Uh, see if I can get my fat hand out of the way where you all can see it. Push it to the side and lift it all the way up to where it's, it's all the way up at the top. You're then going to look for a little triangle on the processor. It's actually right here in this corner. It matches up to a small white circle right here. So I'm going to orient it in that direction. And that's the direction that the processor sits. Do not force the processor. Place it. It should fall straight into the holes. You can give it just a tiny little wiggle to make sure it's in the hole. And you'll be able to tell when it is because it'll drop down in there and there'll be no wiggle. You then take that lever and you push it down and that's it. Our processor is now seated in the socket and mounted. The next step is we need to put a thermal compound on our processor. That serves as a medium between the processor and the cooler. Remember, this is our cooler from AMD. See that copper plate on the back or that copper core? It has to contact that heat spreader. This paste makes a layer there that will make sure there is even contact and help transferring the heat. So you have to make sure both surfaces are clean. I've already done this, and in fact, if you just purchase this cooler, it'll already have compound on there for you. So that's a pretty nice benefit. If it needs to be cleaned off or you have to place your own, you can just get any um, uh, thermal paste. I'm using Arctic Silver here. And you just make, uh, make a little bit about the size of a small pea. And you do it right in the center of the processor. That's probably even too much, what I put right there. Doesn't take much to get this right. Too little is really bad. Too much just makes a big mess. So there you go. Now currently the motherboard was shipped with a water cooling bracket installed. We have to take a screwdriver and remove these two brackets here because the air cooler uses those four screws to attach through the back of the motherboard. All right, so I have uninstalled the, um, the type of mount that was on there. This mount, I said it was for a water cooler. It's also the same type of mount that the Big Brother processor to this one comes with. The 2700X comes with a beefier um, built-on cooler, um, so it also uses that mount. This one, you can see now, we have the four screws here. They're gonna connect into these four, and it's a rectangular pattern, so there's only two orientations. Um, we can put it this way, which I like, because the fan actually plugs in right here. So you always want to think about how your cable is going to go. You can see that this fan has a four pin header and the CPU fan header on this motherboard is right here. And that's the one that this cooler plugs into. So I'm going to go in this orientation. So what you do is you just gently get it aligned and you're going to feel the thermal paste squish down on there. Right there, I can feel the thermal paste squishing. You're going to get your screws aligned. I'm going to use kind of a long screwdriver here because it's easier to get to. You're going to have to line up these screws. I don't have the ratchet in the right direction. Um, you need to cross tighten these. So just get, get it to catch. It may kind of help to get one hand behind the motherboard so you can keep a firm grip on it and kind of squeeze it down. 
it's okay to put pressure. There's going to be a solid connection uh, physically. There, I've got the two diagonals connected, and now the other two should be a little easier. All right, I've now got all four screws connected. You want to tighten it down, but don't go ludicrous tight. It just needs to be tight. Don't do anything too crazy. In fact, now that I've been doing some work, um, these will only tighten down so far. So you go until it stops. Don't put any pressure past that. You can see there, as I screw it in, this is a ratcheting screwdriver, so it makes it a little bit easier. There, all of them have gone in and they stop, so I've got equal pressure, and we're now mounted with our cooler. Like I said, you may have to get your hand behind it, use a little force to make sure those screws connect. Once they do, gently tighten until they don't tighten anymore. No need to do anything else. And now the cooler is firmly attached, and our thermal paste will be spread across. And then you just take this four pin header here. You can see the four pin fan header and it plugs right here. There's only one way to do it because there's a little plastic slot. And we're gonna connect our CPU fan. Voila, that is it. So our CPU cooler is connected. We'll manage the cable later. Now we're gonna plug in our RAM and you need to look in the manual to know which slots to plug the RAM into, it will tell you if you have one piece or one stick of RAM, two, or four, how you plug them in and in what order. All right, a quick look in the manual tells me that the first two slots that we're supposed to populate, because remember we have two sticks of RAM, are A2 and B2. And if you look at your motherboard, in this case, there's a little diagram right here that's probably hard for you to see, but it tells me that that is going to be the second and fourth slot. Now on DDR4 memory, one side, there's a small gap right there in the middle. That's going to tell you exactly how to place this. One side is shorter than the other, and it looks like we're going to be plugging it in. There's a slot. You literally just fit it in the slot. I have the, the ends open, so you just open the little snaps there, fit it directly in the slot. Make sure it is actually in the slot, because like right there, I have it misslotted still miss slotted. There. Now I've actually got it lined up with the slot. I'm going to put my fingers on both sides and push, and you should hear a click. I'll do one side at a time. Bottom side, clicked. Top, clicked. Now the RAM is installed, and we're going to do the same thing with the second stick. It goes in slot four. I'm going to try and do a better job lining it up this time. One click, two clicks. So RAM installed, cooler installed. We're now ready to mount the motherboard in our case. Um, can you do this inside the case? Yes, you can. But I think um, it's easier to do outside the case, especially for people doing a build for the first time. So that's just my recommendation. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is install this uh, input-output shield. It fits right here in this rectangular cutout. And this is where the input-output for your motherboard is plugged in. So all your keyboard, mouse, um, sound, everything that plugs into the back of the computer, Ethernet, it's all going to plug in um, to the back of the motherboard back here. And this little protector just keeps dust and everything from getting inside your build. And you'll hear it snap into all four corners. You give a little tap, and it's installed. The next step is we have to get our, and I say this, some of these steps are interchangeable. I like to do the steps in these order. Um, the next thing I want to do is put the power supply in because it goes down here in the bottom of the case and You can see the fan here on the power supply and you can also see the grill on the bottom of the case Which means that our power supply is actually going to be sitting like this inside the box um, Or sorry, it's gonna be sitting like this because the power that goes to the wall has to be on the outside And of course it doesn't slide in right there. It has to be inserted and I'll show you all where all right, instead of just saying the angle's weird, I fixed it. Um, so anyway, this is um, where we need to plug in the different cables we need. So I will go ahead and help you all with this. I know what we're gonna have. We're going to need our motherboard power, which is 28 pins in total. On this particular power supply, it is an 18 here and a 10 here. 
So there's a bag of cords that come with the power supply. That's what this one is right here. And the good thing about these is they're kind of idiot proof. Um, they'll only fit where they belong. Um, so that's a nice thing that they've done. So we're gonna go ahead and plug these cords in now before placing the power supply in there because once you get it in there, look, you've got very little room to work. So it's good to plug it in outside and then install it. So there's a small uh, notch here that's cut out. You can see it's supposed to fit right there. So I'm gonna take the 18 pin and plug it where it belongs. This is the motherboard power. And see, you can feel when it clicks in. These are sometimes very tight connections. So if you have to give it a bit of a shove, it's okay. But do you remember that the, it, there's shapes and it'll only fit in one way. It's kind of like those little toys when you're a kid where you got to fit the shapes in the hole. The next thing we know we're going to need, our processor needs power. And for this motherboard, it is one eight pin connection. And we're going to look for on here where it says CPU. And that's right here on this line. It says CPU slash PCIe. So we can plug in either one. So our eight pin CPU power. Um, I'm sitting here thinking how this is going to be oriented when we get it in there. It's going to be like this. And I want this one to have enough room. So we're going to put it in the first slot right here. So think about the orientation of your cables like I did, just did there. If you have to, move it in the position where it belongs. Now our graphics card is also going to need power. And that, in the case of this um, RTX 2060, um, it is going to be the 8-pin plug on this side. And then the other side, um, we'll take a look, it's right here. It's eight pins on both sides. And uh, so we have a cord that has the eight pin PCIe power plug. And then the other side, I've already run through the case. And this also says CPU PCIe. PCIe is also in reference to your graphics card because it plugs into a PCIe slot. So we're gonna plug that one in right there as well. Now, what else could we be needing here? We have two storage devices that both run off of SATA power. You can see right here, it says IDE, actually you probably can't see, but I'll try and make it a little better. It says IDE SATA, and it's a six pin plug. So we're gonna need that one. Here's the six pin SATA plug. You can see that's the one that goes into the power supply. The rest of the SATA plugs are this weird L shape. There's a tiny little notch on the end, kind of hard to see because the camera probably won't focus right. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of those plugs all on one cord. So we can plug in our hard drives and anything else we might need to. Now, what I like to do here, we'll go ahead and plug this one in. And honestly, sometimes it's not a bad idea to just go ahead and plug a second one of these in if you have room to tuck away the cord. And we do. And that's because sometimes it can be hard to reach these to every place you need it to be. And it doesn't always hurt to have a secondary um, just in case you need to put it where, it where it belongs. So I am gonna go ahead and plug in a second. Your power supply should come with them and we should be good. Okay, actually I'm gonna be dumb. I decided I'm not gonna plug in a second one right now because I can't find the cable because the box is up in the attic. But in any case, we got these plugged in and now all I have to do, remember the fan goes down. So I was about to make a dunce mistake there. So fan goes down because it has to pull air in through the grill. I'm gonna slide it into position and it's gonna need a little bit of a shove to get in and out of here because there's not a lot of room. Uh, depends on the case. Sometimes they slide in from the back. This one slides in from the side. Now I'm gonna turn and show you all. It's pretty simple. Okay, so you can see here, I don't have it quite lined up. So we need to get it in line. And you can see now that we're getting one, two, and then three and four. Now, the design of your power supply may be different by manufacturer. That's why you see some extra spots that this one doesn't line up to because they're making it universal. Now, once you get those lined up, just get your screws um, that were on the case. These, these screws for the power supply should already be on the case. If not, sometimes they come with the power supply. Just go ahead and get them started finger tight. So you can see here, I'm gonna finger tight all these screws and then I'll get my screwdriver and then just snug it up real tight. Um, you don't have to strip the screw, but get it nice and tight. You don't want your power supply moving around um, if you're going to transport your case potentially. Now, as you're building, you may notice a giant pile of cords. <laughs> it's okay. This is normal while you're building. Um, don't worry about managing these yet. You can kind of get them roughed into position. 
um, but these chords will get managed towards the end. So don't worry exactly what they look like right now. So if you see chords everywhere and you're getting worried, don't be worried. This is normal. It doesn't mean you're doing a crappy build at this point, okay? Okay, this shot is going to be a little janky because I had to prop this up on a box to get the right angle. Um, we need to now mount our motherboard into the case. That's going to be our next step is to get the motherboard mounted. Now remember we put the cooler on and we put the RAM on already. And we, al we also put our in input-output shield back there. There are nine screws to attach our particular motherboard because it is what's called an ATX motherboard. That's just referencing a size, a form factor. You can even see there's a little guide right here in this case. It says ATX, Micro, and Mini. And it gives you a marker, A, M, and I. And next to each screw in here, you can see it has a letter and it's telling you where to mount. So the nine screws for an ATX, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can't see the, the bottom row because they're down towards uh, where that shroud is blocking it, this shroud right here. Um, in any case, nine screws. Um, they'll only fit in, you know, if you get it in the right place. So we need to mount our motherboard. I already have some cables running through here. This is going to be easiest if you don't, so I'm going to push these cables back for a second. You want a nice clear area for you to lay the motherboard down into. You don't want to get any cables pinned underneath it because um, that's not good for it, and you're going to potentially pinch a cable. Um, also, your case... Um, sorry, I'm trying to get a little fan cord out of the way here. It's getting annoying. Um, also, your case may not have come with the standoffs installed. There are little screw holes here, and each one of them has a, a small hexagonal standoff, which basically keeps your motherboard from actually touching the metal back plate here. The standoff gives it, you know, probably about a quarter of an inch distance away from the case, um, or, you know, however many millimeters. I don't really know what it is in millimeters right now. Um, those may have to be installed, meaning there may just be a raw screw hole there. If so, your case comes with a little tool that acts as kind of a socket. It goes over the top of the standoff and then you use a screwdriver to crank those down tight. So you may have to install those first. I already have them installed here. Some cases already have them installed. It just depends. It's pretty easy to do. So again, don't be worried if you get a case that's not this one, that may have to happen. All right, let's put the motherboard in and I'm gonna show you what it's like. Okay, one more thing I wanna point out before we put the motherboard in. Every case is gonna be a little different. Um, and when you buy a case, of course, make sure that it fits the size of the motherboard you got. In this case, we have an ATX motherboard. This case supports three different kinds, and they're listed right there. ATX, Micro ATX, and Mini ITX. Um, so this case could hold three different types. Some cases can only hold one type. You need to look that up on the specifications. If you buy this case, it'll, it'll take all three of those. Also, you're going to need case fans. Um, I would say you want at least two case fans, one exhaust and one induct um, at a minimum. If your case doesn't come with fans, I would say you want a minimum of two, and you'll have to look at what size the case fits. Um, in this particular case, um, it comes with three 120 millimeter fans in the front, and uh, you can see those mounted, and then it comes with one 120 millimeter exhaust fan in the back. This just means we'll be taking in a lot more air and pressure and uh, we'll be pumping it out the back. There's plenty of holes in the back and grating and everything, so even though we only have one exhaust fan, it'll be okay. So this case should have plenty of airflow moving from front to back, and that's good. That's all, that's all you need is just a little airflow in every case, and it should do just fine. Uh, is it better to have more? Sure. Can you put more fans in? Can I put fans on the top that are exhausting too? Sure. That'll just be more pull through the case and more air, but it's not 100% necessary. Um, typically also from the top, you usually want to exhaust if you're going to put fans up here um, because inducting fans are going to be pulling dust into your system. Now there's a dust filter. You can do it, but if you think about it, the natural flow of air, you want it to come in and then either up or out the back. Um, so that would be a good natural flow as opposed to trying to pull air down in here while hot air in the case is also trying to rise. It just doesn't make the most sense. So could you do it? Yes. It's best though to have like a clear airflow path, and that's what we have right now. Okay, now let's put the motherboard in. I'm going to go ahead and get it lined up. Um, the back, the input output on your motherboard, you can see here all the USB things have to line up with that shield that we installed on the back, and then the screws, um, the standoffs rather, uh, in the case have to match up to these little holes here that we're going to put our screws through. 
So I'm going to take the motherboard, go ahead and start laying it down, and kind of be gentle again so I don't scrape anything up. But um, of course, you know, you know, a little bit of movement's not going to hurt or anything. I'm going to make sure that it's lined up to the input-output shield, so that's what I'm going to do real quick. Okay, you can see there, it took me a couple seconds. I even had to bend a little bit of metal on the input-output shield to get it to fit. That happens occasionally. That's normal. I can now clearly see that all nine of my holes are lined up with the standoffs. And when I look at the back of the case, I know you can't see it here, all of the inputs and outputs are lined up properly with the shield. So that's how you know that your motherboard is in the right position. It now, your case came with those nine screws, so now you just screw them in. I'll go ahead and do that. One more note real quick. I have a toolkit for building computers because I do it all the time. It comes with everything I could need, like a static strap, some extra parts, um, tweezers, uh, but honestly, I mean, if you have a, a screwdriver, that's really all you need to build a computer these days for the most part. I do have this tool right here because putting in the motherboard screws is definitely not a job for the fat of fingers, which I sometimes am. Um, and this screw just helps me hold, or this tool just helps me hold on to a, a screw to get it started, and then it's easy for me to put them in. A magnetic tip screwdriver is also useful. But again, you can do this without any of those. All you really just need is a screwdriver like this. It'll do the job. I'll just give you all a bit more of advice while I'm getting these started. Um, when you do get these motherboard, uh, these ATX screws in, um, you want to tighten them down snug, and then you'll want to kind of just tug around on the edges of your motherboard, make sure everything's good and snug. Uh, you don't want to over-tight these. Um, if you get them too tight, and it like really pinches down hard on one part of the motherboard, it can create a short. And I don't, I mean, it may not, per it may, but it may not permanently ruin your motherboard, and, uh, and don't be scared while I'm telling you this. I'm just giving you tips, right? I've, I've made my motherboard screws a little too tight sometimes, and I've only run into a short once. And it's kind of confusing because your computer won't boot up for the first time. And, uh, you, you know, you kind of just have to go through checking things, and eventually I found out. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, snug them down. Uh, don't just start, like, muscling them in. You know, this is a computer. It's not some kind of piece of machinery that's going to be under heavy vibration or, or loads. So snug, not insane. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish putting these in. It's not something that you, I mean, you don't need to, me to show you how to use a screwdriver, I don't think. Okay, I've finished putting in all the screws. I'm going to give a little tug on the motherboard. Nothing is loose. I can't hear any rattling or anything, so it's firmly in place. Uh, you can see that we have this little bit of extra cord here. We can take care of that later by just um, kind of pinning it down out of the way with a little zip tie, but I can just even show you like right there by hand, I can clean that cord up pretty quick. Um, so don't worry, again, no, no worrying about cords at this point. Um, the next thing we need to do is, now that we have the motherboard installed, we need to start plugging in some power connectors. It'll be a little hard to see, but right up here in this corner, um, that is our 8-pin CPU power connector. And remember the uh, power connection from our power supply? Um, it actually comes in two 4-pin pieces. I don't know why they do that. But once again, there's going to be uh, these little uh, latches on top of it, and you'll be able to see where it clips on to that 8-pin power uh, plug right there. So plug that one in first because it's hard to get to, and we want to take care of that right away. All right, you can now see my 8-pin power is plugged in. Uh, now we want to plug in the 24-pin motherboard power connector. Um, so I already had it kind of pre-routed here just to make this a little easier for video's sake. It's a very thick cable. <laughs> No pun intended, here it is. It's very thick. It's gonna be a very tight fit. It goes on this 24 pin power connector. And again, it's got the little latch there, you can see. And then there's the little notch right there that the latch catches on. So it'll only go in one way. If it just won't go in at all, see how it kind of started easy? It should start easy, but then it's gonna be a pretty tight squeeze. So you kind of have to work it down a little bit from both sides. And this part always I hate because you're pushing <laughs> A little harder than what feels like you really want to, um, but it's just kind of necessary the way that these things are kind of a tight fit. And there I heard it click, so now my motherboard power is connected. All right, so the next step, everything's a little different. Now we're looking at the back of the case. This is the motherboard we just installed right there. Um, every case is a little different, but they're all going to come, uh, you can see right up here from this, this um, uh, what is this, going to be your top left corner. Um, there's, there's power cords running down, and this is what's called our, our, front, um, our front input. And on the front of every computer, there's usually USB ports, a power button, 
and whatever else is up there. And that's what all these cords are doing, is they're making all that stuff work. So this connector is for the front USB ports. This is a USB 3.0 connector. Um, we're gonna want to route it through uh, the hole here towards the motherboard. Now, I just took a look at the place where you plug in, and if you need to know where to plug this in, the motherboard manual will tell you, but I'll show you here in just a minute. Get that fuzz off there. Um, this plug is gonna actually need to come in through the bottom because of the way this particular motherboard works. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, there's a cutout down here in the bottom. I'm gonna go ahead and route that up through there. And then just looking at the other plugs that are coming in from the top, we've also got this um, HD audio. So this is for if you're wanting to plug headphones into the front. And I know the MSI motherboards, that's gonna be down here on this back side. So there's another cutout right back here. I'm gonna go ahead and feed that HD audio up right over there. And then I'll show you how to plug those in. All right, this is another one of those camera shots that's a little bit tricky, but I'm doing the best I can. Um, so here's our USB plug, and I'm gonna get my shadow out of the way as best I can. Uh, the plug for that is actually right here. So it only plugs in one way. There's a little notch on the top, and we can see the notch on this. So I'm gonna run the extra cord out the back as best I can. This is a very stiff cord. Um, just, you know, do your best. There we go. So my front USB is now plugged in. See the table even shaking there, because you, you know, you gotta give that one a little shove. Our HD audio plug, it's gonna be very difficult to see on this angle, so I'm gonna tilt this up just a little, move that out of the way. HD audio, I'll have to come at it from the top, is way over here down in the corner. And if you get a good look, which it's gonna be hard to do without the camera focusing, which it probably won't, um, there's a certain number of pins on here. It's actually gonna be nine pins, and one of them will be because there's a blank spot. It's hard to explain, but you'll see that it only fits one way. I can actually see how that is right now. I'm gonna take that cord. I know you won't be able to see while I'm plugging it, but just kind of give you all an example. It's only gonna go on one way, and that's intentional to make sure you don't screw up your build. All right, HD audio is now plugged in right there. All right, this next piece I'm gonna show you is regarding the fans on the case. Um, the case in the rear, or the fan in the rear of the case um, is not RGB, um, meaning it doesn't have any lights, uh, and it just has one power plug that goes into the motherboard. I'll show you how that works. The rest of the fans, the ones on the front, have two plugs for each fan. I'm gonna get these out here where you can see it as best you can. One is for lighting. That's gonna be this plug. You can see there's three pins there. Uh, the three pin is addressable RGB. That's like the rainbow unicorn barf type RGB. And of course there's a four pin RGB and that one is the older, like it can change colors, but it's all one color. And then you have your fan power plug here. Um, it's a four pin. So all these have to be plugged in. This one makes the fan turn, the power plug. This one makes the fan light up. Now this particular motherboard I'm using, uh, this is a newer version of RGB than when this motherboard released. Um, and so you can usually plug RGB right into your motherboard, but if it doesn't have the right plug, you can use a controller like this one that Cooler Master had in one of the packages they sent me. Um, so you always need to check that ahead of time. Again, RGB is optional though, so that's why, you know, if it doesn't light up, it's fine. If it still works, and you can always work on this stuff later, or just forget it because it's not entirely necessary. Start off with um, another thing that comes in handy. Now this motherboard has uh, four fan headers, meaning that we can plug four different fans in, um, and I do have four fans. Um, now the only tricky part of that is these cables are only so long, so remember they have to route through and they actually have to reach one of the fan plugs. There are fan extension cables, and there are fan splitters, meaning that like this cable right here turns two fans, see on that end, into one on the other, and it gives you a bit of an extension. It is usually a good idea before you do a build uh, to buy a fan extension um, just in case because it won't reach to a spot on your motherboard. Um, so I would recommend that highly when you're going into a build. Uh, what I'm gonna do is take a look at the fan headers and see uh, which ones, if any, make sense to hook together into one. All right, now um, I'm always bragging about how great MSI motherboards are, and in this case, it works out that way. <laughs> There are three fan headers, perfect for our front three fans. We don't even need the splitter. All we need to do is, uh, there's three fan headers right where we're gonna want them. I'm just gonna go ahead and run each fan cable through the top one on the top, middle one kind of towards the middle here, and uh, we'll double check. And then the, uh, the fan header from the bottom, 
uh, this one way down here. I'm going to go ahead and run it towards the bottom. And you can see now I've got those kind of pre-routed, and I'll show you how they get plugged in. Okay, so I'm a little bit of a liar, but it was an accident, I promise. Um, there were three fan headers. One of them was a water pump header. You can put one of your system fans in the water pump header, but I don't like to because it's a little different than the way you set up those profiles. Um, so I did go ahead and use the fan splitter. So my top two case fans, one, two, are connected into this splitter, which turns two into one, and then it's plugged right here into the system fan three. And that was one of the, anything on an MSI motherboard that says sys fan, that's one of your case fans or system fans. And then there was a system fan um, four plug right here, and you don't have to have all these plugged in in order. So that's my bottom case fan down here. The cord came up and plugged in there. And now the only fan we have left is this one here in the back of the case. And you can see that that's the cord to it. And system fan one plug is right here in the back of the case. It's, um, this is only a three pin fan. Some are three pins, some are four. You can still use it on a four pin motherboard header. It just only fits onto three of those four pins. So not a big deal. See there, I've plugged it in. You might see a little bit of ugly cord. All you gotta do, just take the extra cord, get a zip tie, and, or sometimes you can even just tuck it in without any problem, like right there. I can kind of get it tucked away. So now we don't have a whole lot of fans. So our four fans are now plugged in. Let's move on to the next step. The next thing I wanna do, we have two um, storage devices. Um, and I'm gonna show you those again. We have two storage devices. Like I said, one of them is this solid state drive. And this is a SATA, S-A-T-A, -A, it's an abbreviation, serial A-T-A, -A, um, and it has these plugs on the back. This is the one that runs the data. I know it's going to blur a little bit because my autofocus is kind of crap, but you can see it plugs into the back of the drive right there. Well, the other end has to plug into the motherboard, and that's what these little plugs are right here. They're just on the side. There's only one way it can fit. It has a little L shape um, you might be able to make out there. Um, so there's only one way it fits. So what you want to do is look at your motherboard manual again. Um, we have all these different SATA ports and just make sure you know which ones you want to plug into uh, in order to get um, the best performance. I'm going to go ahead and plug into SATA 1 and 2 which are way down here. Actually, that's going to look kind of ugly but I'm going to bump this. You still can't quite see it. SATA 1 and 2 are way down here on the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and use those first just to be doing it in order. Um, it honestly though probably doesn't even matter. Um, I could easily just run those cables uh, out right there if I wanted. In fact, I think I probably will. So listen to me sitting here giving you advice. I'm going to break it. The only time it really matters um, which, which of these you're plugging into is if you start getting a whole lot of different storage devices, sometimes it limits the speed of um, the devices that you'll plug in. In this case, with only two, we're not going to have to worry about it. Both of them are SATA, and we're not going to be running any speeds down. So I have one SATA cable plugged in in number three, and then right on top of it, I'm going to plug in SATA four. So you can see that one, I clicked it in. So now I've got plugs running for our two drives. Um, one of our drives, the solid state drive, is actually going to sit right here on top of this shroud. I'll show you how we plug that one in. It needs power and data. And then our spinning hard disk, our bigger storage, also needs those same plugs there on the end, power and storage. So let me show you how both of those go in. Huge tangled mess of cables. Yes, that's right. I told you there's going to be a big mess of cables. This is normal. If you uh, dig apart the mess of cables, look, it's a hard drive cage all built into this. Um, and I've already, um, you can look at the instructions that come with your case. I've already put this spinning hard drive on a little carriage that fits in this tray. And this is a very nice feature that Cooler Master has built in here. This is like just a hot swap. Um, you can just throw these in and out really easily. So you can see that's gonna just plop right in there. So our hard drive is now mounted. Now remember that we had these uh, SATA plugs coming from the motherboard. We need two things, power and data. So the SATA cord here is for the data, SATA data. Huh, right, am I right? Yeah, I am right. I thought I plugged it in wrong while I was saying I was right. Um, that's actually kind of a terrible plug for that one. Give me just a second. This is the one I was looking for. This is a 90 degree plug that came with my MSI motherboard. It's kind of nice for this one because we want this to be flush. So we're going to go ahead and plug that in there. 
Um, the other one, I'll show you where that plugs for the solid state drive in a minute. But let's go ahead and get one of these power. Now remember, there's multiple power plugs along a SATA, at least in this particular style. It has kind of an L shape to it, and I can see that the little L shape is on this side. So I'm just going to plug that in. And now there is power and data to that hard drive, and I have enough slack left over to run this over here underneath to my solid state drive, which I know is going to mount here in the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and start rolling that there. Now let's go ahead and mount our solid state drive. For this particular case, um, we're going to mount our solid state drive. There's these four rubber grommets down there, and there's four little metal standoffs that kind of screw into the bottom. Trying to think how to get you the best angle of that. It's going to take a second to focus. You can see them kind of poking down there. They fit in those four holes. And of course, we just need to plug in our power and data. So remember, two plugs for any SATA device. Data is in the SATA plug. I just got that one plugged in. My case is all over the place. So yeah, I'm not trying to rhyme here. It's just happening. Call me uh, Dr. Air the Rhymes. Um, actually, call me something cooler than that, please. Um, <laughs> any case. I've got it plugged in now, and you want to plug it in first. Then we just uh, seat those little standoffs right into the rubber grommets, and it just pushes down for a nice soft mount. And if you want to pull it out, no tools required. You just lift it up. There we go. Solid state drive mounted. We are almost finished, folks. All right. Who likes tedious? Okay, no, this is one of the more tedious parts. Fortunately, it doesn't take long. Now, many of you know that on your computer case, there's usually a button up front where you can push it to turn off the computer, or to restart the computer, or there's little LEDs that are showing you that your power's on or anything else. That's what these little plugs are that come from the front. Each one of these is two pins on this particular case. One is for a hard drive LED, the other is for a power switch, so power SW, and then the other one is a reset switch, reset SW. Now, my first computer, this, this kind of scared me a little doing this part, but it's not that bad. I zoomed in a little. I still don't have the best angle to it, but um, there is a port on MSI motherboards called JFP1. FP meaning front panel. And on this case, the um, JFP1 port is going to be right here. It's, I'll try and come at it from above, right there. Um, so that's your JFP1 port. Uh, you have to look in your guide to know where to plug each one of these, and each one has a plus and minus, and they have to be on exactly the right peg. Hard for me to show you that. Get into your manual. It has very detailed instruction to show you how to do it. Even if you're first time, you can do it. Uh, I just don't have the means or camera to really get in here and film this, but I'll show you what it looks like when it's plugged in. All right, I've got them plugged in right here. There was three plugs, which takes up a total of six of the nine pins that are down there. Um, so I have the power switch, a reset switch, and the hard drive LED plugged in. Take your time, look at the manual, get these right, because if you don't get these right, and you finish building your computer, and you push the power button to turn it on, and you plug it in wrong, it won't turn on. So, um, and you might be frustrated, like, oh no, it's not working. It could be something little like that. So just make sure you take your time, look in the manual, on an MSI motherboard, it's called JFP1. All right, folks, this is the last part that we have to install on the computer. We're getting very close to being able to try and boot up and get into Windows. Um, so we need to install our graphics card. Now remember, that is our MSI uh, Ventus RTX 2060. This card was $350 US and will easily do what we need it to on high settings and total war. Um, so we're going to use this PCIe by 16 slot. If you look at the manual on your motherboard, it'll tell you the recommended slot to put your first graphics card in. Um, I say first because you can put more than one, though you really don't need to. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure this little bracket here is open. And then there are little dust guards here on the back of the computer that have a screw in them. Um, I had to, like you take your card basically, size it up how it's going to slot in. And then I knew that I had to take out those two guards up here on the very top of that. Um, and that's because uh, that spot on the back, that's where your video out, or video out ports go to your monitor. So if you look, there's a notch on the graphics card right there. That notch goes right there. And the little L-shaped little hook thing over here 
is going to be fitting in right there where that bracket holds it. So that's the way you line it up. The fans are going to be facing down, and the heat sink, this or this back plate here, is going to be facing up. It's not a heat sink; it's a back plate. Um, line it up to the slot. Um, once you know that it's lined up, give a little shove till you hear that click. That's the um, that's the little latch over there, relatching. Um, it's going to be kind of a pain, but you got to get these screws in over here on the side. I'll sh I'll do that real quick. Okay, I've got those two screws um, started over here. I'm just going to take my screwdriver. You'll want to tighten it down real good and tight. Again, you know, like don't strip the screw out or anything, um, but get it real tight because this actually supports a lot of the weight of your graphics card. And uh, this one's not real, real heavy, um, but it's still kind of heavy. You can see that gave the graphics card a lot of support. And now all we got to do is plug our power in right here. This is one eight pin power. And then right here is the one eight pin power that came from our power supply that we plugged in earlier. And there's a little notch on it. It only fits one way. You can kind of see how it started there. Push until you hear it click. And there we go, folks. Our computer is built. I need to put the case all the way back together, but some people say that's bad luck. So let's plug it in first, see if this thing will run. And um, then, you know, then later on you can put your case together and manage your cables. All right, just last thing to mention before we try and turn this thing on, uh, the cables still look ugly, but guess what? This is the back of the computer. People aren't gonna see it. This particular case has decent cable management. Some are better, some are worse. But all you have to do is just make sure those are going to lay flat and our side panel will still attach and everything's just fine. It doesn't have to look good because it's behind a metal panel and no one will see it. We manage the cables inside the case where people can see so it looks like a super clean build and that's the secret. You don't have to do a lot back here. All I did was zip tie one thick cable down to where it would stay in place. That's it. No magic here, folks. All right, so I plugged the power into the computer, a keyboard and mouse. And you can see here, um, we didn't go straight to the splash screen. What you're usually going to see is, well, I'll show you in just a minute. I've already installed some things on this um, uh, hard, or the, these drives before, and I didn't clear it off. So basically, it popped up this screen, letting us know that, hey, you changed your hardware. Do you want to run setup? That's where it says press F1 to run setup. And I'm sorry, this is a little blurry. Um, I don't have my screen capture set up right now, and I'm just doing the best I can. Cameras don't like recording screens. Um, so I'm going to push F1. And the fact that we're here in BIOS, <laughs> this is very good news. This means our build is working. Um, and we can look at a few things here that are going to be very important. Uh, remember that we put a... Uh, I'm going to push F7 here to go to the advanced mode. Um, and let's just uh, show you everything so right here on the screen, uh, I'm going to put the mouse on it so you can see it. Right there is our temperature. So remember we put a cooler on our processor, and that cooler is working well. 32C is a very nice idle temperature for an air cooler. So at least for now, we haven't tested under load, but we've tested it um, you know, just in an idle. Our temperature is good. Our CPU speed is reading correct. The base speed of this processor is 3.6. I believe it boosts up to you know four or maybe a little over four, but it's running at base. Um, our RAM speed is 2400, so it's automatically detected that. You can see that where it says DDR speed. Um, the only other thing that we could do in here is set up our fans, but that's not even really very important right now. They're all running. Um, I will actually get you a view of the computer running here. Okay, so giving you a quick view of the computer here um, actually running, the fans just defaulted to that blue. Um, again, this is not a video tutorial on how to use RGB equipment because that equipment is not necessary. It came with this case though, so it's going to light up and look good. You see the motherboard's actually got a red LED on there and then you got the blue. It actually looks pretty good uh, the way it is, so I'm going to leave it. Um, but yeah, anyway, you can see the fan spinning on the CPU cooler and you can see all the case fans. Well, you can't see the one in the back, but you can see the three in the front spinning. Um, our graphics card, everything powered on. Um, we didn't get any warnings, and we got to that splash screen, so our computer build is looking very, very good here. Okay, so we're back into BIOS. There's nothing else we need to do here except uh, make sure our uh, boot drive is set up in the proper order. Right there, when I highlight that first one, it says um, Hard Disk, Windows Boot Manager, Kingston. Um, I've already installed Windows on this previously. If you need to install Windows, of course, there's videos to show you how to do that. You can buy Windows on a flash drive, 
or you can use your own flash drive and create a Windows install file. And at this point, you know, you would just plug in that flash drive and then where it says USB, you would set that as your boot priority and then Windows walks you through. We should be able to escape from BIOS and boot into Windows. And there you are, folks. We are booted into Windows. We've got ourselves, our computer, working. <laughs> Air's backup PC, how do you all like that? All right, so now here's what really counts. We built this computer, how does it perform? Well, I've got Total War Warhammer 2 set up here on 1920 by 1080 resolution, ultra preset, so this is the ultra settings. Uh, I'm also letting the load screen play here so you all can get a feel for how well the solid state drive does in cutting down loading times. You can see it loads very quickly and I will let the performance in this benchmark speak for itself. y'all like that about 800 something dollars for this build and about almost 80 frames a second on a very demanding game now that is impressive that is just downright awesome performance at the price point that we're building now i also threw in some 3d mark uh, benchmarks this is the time spy dx11 benchmark and i'm going to show you how this compares to some of the other builds that i've made but you know i'll just let let this run a little bit let you all see some of these tests this game, uh, or this, this build obviously can run these things very smooth, it does a great job. Let's show you the results of that and I'll talk about it when it's over. And yes, there is no sound on the Time Spy benchmark, in case you all thought maybe I botched something there. No, it doesn't have any sound. Kind of would be nice if it did, I guess. But um, yeah, so 7384 score. Uh, that's pretty good uh, overall. It's uh, I'll, I'll show you all some results comparison, but it's a couple of stats I wanted to look at. This here maps my CPU temperature and the warmest we got. And remember, this is just on a stock cooler with 62C. That is very, very nice. Um, all things considered, our GPU actually got just a hair over 70. Now, this is with a stock fan setting. The fans don't even turn on until this GPU gets over 60. So all things considered, that's not bad either. And you could turn up those fans, it would still be silent and you would stay under 70 all the time. So our temperatures are great and the performance is great. And just to give you all uh, you know, another feel here, I'm gonna actually flip over to GPU load and let you see that we're never throttling down because of heat, we're full performance across the board. And then our processor is boosting up to over 4.1. Again, this is all stock settings. And there's occasions, and I'll show it to you here in just a second, where we were hitting 4.2 over here. So our processor is boosting up the way that it should. Everything is working well. Now, let's um, hit this compare result online. And I'm going to pull up some of the other builds that I've made. I have two other builds that I want to compare it to, just, just for fun. Um, all these builds serve a different purpose. But first of all, look at this. We tested better than 71% of all gaming computers that took this. So again, price point, we are really rocking it out here. That is not bad at all. And uh, I'm gonna have to go into the um, comparison thing here. Nothing popped up right away. So uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm commenting this afterwards. I'm gonna go click my results screen and we'll pop up two different builds. One, uh, the second the second build we'll compare to is my editing build that has the Threadripper processor, but the same graphics card. And then the third build we'll compare to is my Intel 9900K processor, which is kind of like the zenith of gaming. 
processors, and it has a 1080 Ti. Um, used to be the best. It isn't now, but it's so close to being the best graphics card still that it's still a pretty good comparison. Now, that computer on the far right hand with the 10,077 score is about $4,000, about $3,500 worth of computer um, whenever I built it. Remember, ours on the left is uh, is about $850 worth of computer. So, I mean, is the 2600X as good as a 9900K that costs twice as much? No. But the performance uh, per dollar there is still very, very good. So let's just wrap up a few things. I'll give you a view of the computer again. This, Folks, this may seem like a lot. The video is over an hour long. But remember that in that entire hour, I explained to you the parts that you needed for the computer and showed you how to build all of it step by step. Yes, I edited, so in real life it took a little bit longer than that, but this saves you so much money. This, this computer is cheaper in this configuration than you can go buy a pre-built one. It's, it gives you fantastic performance. You get to game like a pro, and you can do it all, in my opinion, what's reasonable. Is it expensive still? Yeah, I mean, most people, $850 isn't walking around money but it's attainable. You can work hard, you can save the money, and you can do this yourself. You can even start with some of the parts and you know buy into the other ones as time allows. You can watch for sales, you can do all kinds of things to help. So I do hope you all enjoyed the video. This took days of recording and hours of editing and everything to get this to you, but why do I do it? Um, well, obviously my sponsor loves it because MSI sponsors and they want you all to check out all this stuff. And honestly, I want you all to check it out too. I enjoy this kind of thing. I love building computers. I think this is like the 15th or 16th time that I've built a computer when I did this one, and I can't get enough of it. I like it. Um, it can be a little scary if it's your first time, but I would tell you don't be. I was scared to build a computer uh, when I was you know, running my channel back in the Shogun two days. I went and bought a pre-built, and I got ripped off bad. I could have saved hundreds of dollars. Instead, I go down to the store and, and buy a pre-built gaming computer, and it wasn't very good. I ended up having to upgrade it on my own anyway, and I could have just built my own to begin with. So don't don't fall into that. So anyway, go check this out. Uh, this is a great build. Um, all the links to the giveaway are in the description. If you want a new computer to play Total War Three Kingdoms, they gave you the specs. This is what you need to build if you want to run those recommended specs. Um, it's easy to do. Get out there and do it. Hey, thanks again to MSI. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate you being here. Like I said, I love making this content for you. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. I will do my best to answer anything. I want to help you all out. You can join my Discord as well. Link is in the description. And you can come chat at me in the Discord. And I will, again, do what I can to answer you. There's also a great community of folks there who will help you out too. Anyway, Air of Carthage signing out. I will see you all soon.